whenever you have an idea, write it down. Some time ago, I was in the garage and I had this idea and I just wrote it down and now I'm going to revisit it because it just came to me, you know. Uh, I should revisit that. So this is what I wrote down just on some junk, you know. Uh, we need to determine the vibrational frequency of solid pyramids as a function of mass or density. And also, um, also size, the size of the pyramid. So what that means is that's, that's a way to crack the code for the three-dimensional matrix. In 3D printing, uh, every three-dimensional object is rendered by the computer into little bitty triangles. And a triangular pyramid is the simplest point shape you can create, besides a circle, which doesn't have points. But if you're using a, a point-based system where you draw three points in space, that's the simplest geometric shape. And if you draw a fourth point, that creates, if you have an, an equilateral three-dimensional pyramid. So if you have an equilateral three-dimensional pyramid, if you everything can be rendered to that in three-dimensional form. There's a way to render everything in that shape. Hey everybody, regarding the pyramid vibrational frequencies, let's go over some basic math. So I started thinking about it and uh, I started uh, putting some equations down. That was a joke. This isn't basic math, <laughs> but it's not really as complicated as it seems. So don't be intimidated by it. It's like if you, uh, you know, if someone started speaking Chinese to me, I would have no idea. So this is years of engineering uh, stuff that rattles around in my head. And there's probably some mistakes in here. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But I went ahead and uh, printed a 3D printed a equilateral tetrahedron. The uh, kind of one of the simplest shapes, but um, it's got some interesting geometry to make it happen. And... Um, these are our engineering equations for vibrations, okay? Uh, they look pretty intimidating, but each one of these symbols has a meaning, and we're going to kind of walk through it, okay? Now, everything in the physical world can be boiled down to a spring, a mass, and a dampener. And here in this little setup, we have a spring, a mass, and the dampener, which will be the bucket of water. Anytime you have a circular plate with holes in it moving through a fluid, you have a dampening effect. Oil is uh, actually a better dampener. Let's go ahead and get this started. We'll go with the simplest way to do it. We'll just push this spring down and release. Okay. There she goes. Now that is a very simple vibration. It's vibrating at a frequency of about, oh, 0 0.7. I counted it the other day. 0 0.7 hertz. That means it's 70% of, uh, you know, one time per second. So it's like once every 1.3 seconds. All right. And we could weigh the mass, and we could test the spring constant. The spring constant is often called K, but the spring constant is the amount of energy it takes or the amount of force it takes to stretch a spring a certain distance. And here we can see, oh, it's going up and down a foot or 12 inches or 10 inches or whatever it is. And on it goes. Now, obviously, if we put it in the bucket of water, it's going to slow down. The bucket of water represents a dampener, Okay. Now, in these equations, this is the equation for natural frequency. Natural frequency just means it's not dampened. Reality is there is really no natural frequency. I mean, there is, but the reality is there's always dampening because it's going through the air right now, okay? And the spring has, the molecules within the spring are getting hot. They're putting off heat, and that's the same reason that this won't go forever, even if it was in space, because you're losing some energy in the spring there. It's the same reason that the 
new age uh, guys with all their free energy stuff, most of them are scams because a spring can't bounce forever and nor can a magnetic field uh, just magically produce energy. So now there may be some mysteries out there that can produce energy from the environment that it would appear to be free energy and I'm all about studying it, but uh, just be aware there's a lot of scams out there. The spring will eventually stop moving and the amplitude, which is the distance it goes up and down, the amplitude will slowly stop. So <laughs> the frequency is one over two pi. That's a conversion factor. When you see one over two pi, that's the And the spring constant, uh, or uh, <clears throat> this is kind of the magic part of the formula. You take the spring constant K divided by the mass, and then you have the square root of that. And, and that equation determines the frequency of the spacex system, all right? If you wanna get a little more in depth um, in the differential equation world, um, if you wanna know the position of this this object at any any place in time, okay? You can do x, uh, the k is the spring constant, x is the, the distance that it goes up and down. x primed is the velocity, that's the distance over a certain amount of time, and x double primed is the acceleration, that's the change in velocity. So that's from differential equations. Another way to write it is this here. Mass times acceleration plus uh, the velocity, which is um, the uh, you know the, the speed at which it's going, and plus k times the distance. Well, keep in mind that this c here is your dampening coefficient, okay? And like I said, everything has some dampening in it because of how things work in the universe. Um, and uh, if you want to know the position of it, here's another equation um, with this t uh, trigonometry that would allow you to predict where it is in space at any given time. And uh, one, another way to en envision that is that if I take a poster board and I put, you know, I take the dry erase marker and I mount it on this thing, and then I move a poster board past it at a steady speed, it's going to draw a sine wave, right? And so that's, that's representative of that vibration over time. So <clears throat> that's just one mode. Let's see what happens when we do with the dampener, right? Now we've added the dampener. It would be better if it was a bucket of oil, but that's messy. And I've lowered it a little so that the water level's right. Let's try it with the dampener and see how it how it goes. Well, that's pretty much it. It doesn't go much further than that. So you just get a few oscillations. And by the way, that's how a shock absorber works. And the, and the more holes you have in those plates, and the tighter, the thicker the fluid is, like oil, well, then you've got yourself a good shock absorber, and it pretty much stops the vibration. Okay, pretty cool, right? That bucket is C, okay? Velocity is the speed it's going up and down, which at some point, it actually stops, right? And you can set your equation to zero, or you can set it to a force and expect the thing to move. It gets a little tricky, and I'm a little rusty at it. So, that's, part, that's the basics. And everything. the funny thing is, everything in the universe will can fit into these sort of uh this way of looking at things if you if you want it to but it's it's more complicated than that like for example there's other modes of vibration what if we were to take this spring and give it a, a tug right in the center that's a different mode of vibration it's, it's going that direction and it's much faster another way would be a like a shock wave if we were to compress this and then release it you get that neat shock wave and you can see that it has a speed at which it travels up and down 
a shockwave like that. So that's a different mode of vibration. And you can actually hear that one. <laughs> right? So there's all different vibrations. Now, here's one uh, that you can't see, but it's still a vibration on a microscopic level. The sound of that. That note, the sound that it's making, is about, it's a musical note, it's about 460 hertz. Uh, just an A sharp, a little bit of a dull A sharp. Now, that's a vibration too. What's going on there? Well, all of that takes place inside the metal as the impact vibrates the metal molecules themselves and the sound wave goes up and down this tube. It resonates and creates that high frequency vibration. But all of the same things are there. The spring, the mass, and the dampener are all in there inside the me metal at a molecular level. And so that's why these equations can be expanded to different uh, scales, you know. Now to figure out the vibrational frequency of one of these rascals, I started looking at what, um, what we have already uh, known for... Um, vibrations of spheres and there's different modes and and by the way the chat gpt it was giving me all kinds of errors and calculation mistakes so the idea that you're an engineering student you're just going to plug this into chat gpt good luck it's very creative and it helps you it helps you learn but it ain't quite there yet so it gave me these different formulas for different modes of vibration for a sphere we see this repeating one over two pi. That's kind of a standard thing for the, and we have different formulas for different modes of vibration. There's a spheroid, uh, a torsional vibration, there's radial. And so it came up with these different formulas. One's got R squared, the radius squared. One's got the radius cubed. Um, so the, I mean, the volume of a sphere is four thirds pi radius cubed. So this is kind of like similar to that. Um, so it's, you know, volumetric. This one has, uh, <clears throat> one of them uses the speed of sound divided by two pi r, which is the circumference. So we've got all these different uh, formulas just for one object, probably because it has multiple modes of vibration, just like our, our spring there in the spring mass and dampener setup. And instead of a spring constant, when you're figuring it out in a material, you're using uh, the uh, modulus of elasticity divided by the density. Now the modulus of elasticity is kind of like a spring constant. Sometimes you want to use uh, the Young's modulus, as they call it. Other times you want to use the bulk modulus of elasticity. I don't know which one's going to be more accurate, but in the case of aluminum, it's something like 10,000 PSI or something. Uh, or 70, 000, uh, 70 gigapascal, if I, if I remember correctly. And you could just look up the speed of sound for different metals. There's charts online, and, and uh, they say it ranges anywhere from, uh, you know, if it's in one mode, 5,092, in another mode, 6,451. So there's all these different modes and of vibration that the speed of sound can go through a metal. So... <clears throat> Using this, I, I sort of came up with some different uh, test formulas that I want to test um, to be able to figure out the vibrational frequency of, of a, set, a solid tetrahedron. And, and the reason I think this is important is because if you look at this, the points are equally spaced. On a molecular level, you could predict, if you knew the density, the, the packing of molecules, you could, it would be the same as these points distance right here on this so a tetrahedron so i'm thinking that this formula could could be useful you know for uh all tying the microscopic with the macroscopic and the way we're going to test it right this one was the ai's formula 
this one was mine and this one is also mine and we're gonna well uh i'm not sure where this one came from oh yeah i tied the ai's crap in with what i was thinking so like a hybrid um so we're gonna test out these different things and um the way we're gonna do it is i'm gonna fire this thing this plaster melt out the um shape of the pyramid that's in there and then cast aluminum in there and then we're going to figure this out so stay tuned <laughs> 